I call Brendan Burns. Mr. Speaker, I swear that if I hear the phrase the blue green agenda, I'm going to gag. Uh, I, I know that we've seen through the passage of this bill clear evidence that the blue green agenda can be consigned to the waste paper bin. And uh, if you didn't believe it in respect of the environmental protection uh, bill, then you only need to look at the national policy statement on fresh water, which most of the environmental groups, which were a party to the Land and Water Forum, are already condemning. But let me turn first to the uh, contribution uh, from Rahui Kartani on behalf of the Māori Party and talk about trying to make a silk purse out of a kuni kuni's ear when we hear the uh, member opposite uh, saying that the SOP that she has introduced establishing a Māori advisory committee to advise the Environmental Protection Authority is delivering on the Māori Party's commitment to partnership with government. And in fact, it fails dismally in respect of that. Uh, it's not really delivering in respect of any uh, sense of partnership it really is diminishing the treaty because it states really in effect or acknowledges that the advisory board is not much more than a sham in meeting the Crown's treaty obligations. It's watering down the treaty's obligations to the point of providing simply a, a pretty toothless opinion sharing body and I would have thought we have reached a stage in the development of our nation where Māori deserve more that at the last stage of an important bill, a coalition partner representing Māori introduces an SOP which simply delivers a default mechanism in respect of meeting treaty obligations. And that, uh, that uh, committee will deliver no amount of partnerships, no amount of tino rangatira tanga. It is a sad commentary, I believe, on the Māori Party, and, and I, I do find myself in the unusual position of being drawn to some understanding of Hane Harawera and the reason he has defected, defected from the Māori Party. Uh, at the commencement of uh, this part of the bill, uh, this final reading, uh, the Minister uh, tried to portray uh, uh, the Labour Party and myself in particular as opposing economic development because of commentary I've made through the passage of this bill. Nothing could be further from the truth. No, Minister, you do not correctly report me. Nothing could be further tr to the truth. I am a strong supporter of economic development, but I will only support economic development when it is sustainable. And that is not what is being provided for by this bill. It doesn't even include any reference in its, in its uh, principal clauses to sustainability and the principles and objectives don't include real reference back to uh, having environmental objectives. And I, I put on uh, to the record of this House my record of having been instrumental in forming Marlborough's Economic Development Trust. I put on the record of this House having established a, a vineyard which contributes to the export economy of this country and I take a deep offence at the Minister suggesting that I am opposed to economic development. What I am absolutely committed to is sustainable economic development. And I'll say to this Minister, in respect of my province of Canterbury, I am committed to seeing the greening of the plains, but I will not tolerate any more browning of the waters. And I do not believe that your agency has got the power, clout, budget, commitment, nor do you represent in Cabinet a towering presence in respect of environmental protection and we are seeing we are seeing that being affirmed by the parties to the land and water forum and they're starting to peel off 72 hours since the grandiose statements were made about the the, the uh, freshwater policy statement how it was going to deliver nirvana future water quality and already we're seeing organizations who are a party to that process who would also have been looking to this environmental protection bill as a signal that this government was going to hold the line, which was going to improve environmental quality, which was going to enforce protection, and we're seeing fish and game, we're seeing forest and bird, we're seeing the Environmental Defence Society, we're seeing the Water Rights Trust and others saying 
that that national policy statement on freshwater is not delivering what they understood was going to be delivered, and they will be looking, I'm sure, equally at this bill as a record of this minister's failure to deliver in respect of environmental policy and protection. That was what we were looking for. We were looking for something akin to the American model, which outlined five strong goals and principles around clean air and global climate change, clean and safe water, land preservation and restoration, healthy communities and ecosystems, compliance, environmental stewardship, global climate change, all of those things not actually affirmed by this bill. And that is very unfortunate because there was an opportunity there. I wanted to take up and just, uh, just uh, say to the Minister, he made strong comments back to my colleague Louisa Wall in respect of her uh, questioning to him around clause 82 of the bill and whether he has any veto rights in respect of matters that are called in under the clauses of national significance. And just note to him that under uh, clause 7, uh, subclause 7 of uh, that part 80, of clause 82, it reads, to avoid doubt, the Minister may make a direction under subsection 2 that differs from the direction recommended by the EPA under section 144A. So if uh, we still have a, a, another speaker from the government, I'd like some affirmation as to whether or not that provides a mechanism for veto in respect of uh, the Minister's role with call-ins under the uh, uh, events of national significance provided for under this bill. I go back to my opening premise that this bill uh, was seen by many of us as an important piece of legislation. It provided an opportunity for the government to affirm that it truly was committed to a blue-green agenda, to an agenda which was going to balance economic sustainability and environmental outcomes. But unfortunately, that has not come to be, and we've seen that from the, uh, the, 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 the bill in front of us and the allied, I suppose, um, freshwater policy statement just released earlier this week. These are disappointing times because New Zealand has to get this right. We only need to look at the BBC hard talk program of uh, uh, earlier this week where an eminent journalist grilled the Prime Minister about New Zealand's environmental record. Not the first time. Two years ago it was The Guardian claiming that we were doing greenwash, that we had uh, made the claims many times of being a clean and green nation, 100 per cent pure, and the facts were not there. Two years back, two years back, and, the, tr and, and the, the real risks around this are actually there for the farming community. And I say that to, to members opposite from a farming background, such as Colin King, the MP for Kaikoura, and those who represent other rural seats. Those who will pay the price for the failure of the EPA to really grapple the issues of environmental protection in the final analysis will be our farmers, because the rest of the world's farmers are looking at New Zealand. It is being questioned by the global BBC. It's being questioned by other eminent news, newspapers and media organisations. And we have to acknowledge that our reputation is growing more and more tenuous by the day. The EPA was a chance, a chance, for a line to be drawn, a statement to be made, an assertion to be given that the environment was no longer going to be the provider of economic growth for this country that we had to have from here on economic growth that was truly sustainable and part of that it was going to be assured by a standalone watchdog organisation with the resources, with the power, with the clout, with the mandate to enforce environmental regulations and say when you pollute you pay and preclude you from having access to resources if you did not commit to those kind of principles. And so it is with enormous uh, disappointment that I see this bill in its final stages of the House and we only wish that the Minister had taken the opportunities in front of him and assured New Zealanders that the Environmental Protection Authority was going to do what its name suggests. Call Nikki Kaye. Mr Speaker,